Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bone. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. And I think we've got a good one for you because we're chatting to Stony Stonich, who, as a young pilot with not a lot of hours on his ticket, he got a phone call to go work on a movie. And that movie was based on my favorite book of aviation lore, Catch-22 by Joseph Heller. Now, I'm holding up my well-read paperback. I say well-read. I I take care of even my paperback so people don't even think they're read. But this has been read a few times, and I adore it. I even have the fancy, expensive folio edition version as well, which has been read a couple times, which I know to folio edition aficionados out there, they don't like that sort of thing. But books are meant to be read, so read them, people. Anyways, Stoney is a bit of an aviation legend. He also helped form the North American Trainer Association as he had a T6 and managed to bring great numbers of T6s together across the States for many years. So this episode should have been recorded by Scott Marchand a while ago. So this is the second time Stoney's told this story to us because there were some technical issues on Scott's side. We'll leave it at that. And anyways, while we were out at Pima, Scott and I got Stoney on the phone and we had this chat with him. So we're going to talk Catch-22, we're going to talk T-6s, we're going to talk about restoring hurricanes, flying all around the world as well. So there's a lot to get through. And as always, I cannot thank the team at the Pima Air and Space Museum enough for their continued support of the pod. And it is really, really a pleasure to be sponsored by them because that place is remarkable. From any type of aircraft you can think about, they probably have it, including their B-25, which you sort of walk in and under as it's up on some stilts, which they still haven't let me climb up in. So next time, Scott, if you're listening, you hope, hopefully you are listening, but we shall see what we can do on that. They've actually had to padlock the hatch at the back to stop people from climbing around in it, including me. But Check out what they've got going on at www.pimaair.org. As the summer continues, they've been having rain out there, which is quite something. But we're not going to be talking about rain today. We're going to be talking about a few things, including Catch-22 and the remarkable Frank Tolman, who was half of Tolman's productions, who think of a movie, TV series in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and they provided the planes, including the B-25s that Stoney flew. Just a quick note to say that we spoke to Stoney on the phone, so he's not going to appear in the video, but what he did do, which is very kind of him, was sent over a load of the photographs that he took on set. So there's going to be lots of really cool behind-the-scenes images that will be rolling through this. We've got some clips in there as well, and pictures of the personalities and aircraft that we're going to be talking about. So many thanks to Stoney for allowing us to use those. And as we always do when we start off our pods with someone, we have to ask them, why aviation? What was the bug? So let's find out what got Stoney flying. Let's get cracking then. So what started you off in aviation? What was the bug that bit you to learn to fly? Well, uh, actually, my mother was the airport manager and when I was uh, 15, 16, 17 years old, and I had no thought about being a pilot. But when I was uh, 26, started taking lessons at the local airport, which is uh, Torrance, California Airport, named after, God, now I can't remember his name, the guy that uh, was the fa- famous runner from the 1936 Olympics. Just Jesse Owens. No, no, this is an Italian guy from Torrance. That Pirelli? Looking, yeah, we'll, like we'll, that. Yeah, we'll look it up. Yeah. And anyway, so I started taking flying lessons. At the time, I was a, a, a lineman for the local power company. But anyway, I worked my way through uh, private, commercial, and uh, instrument flying, and then started working on my flight instructor rating. And I left the power company at, to become a flight instructor, and uh, flight ins- I was flight instructing at uh, the Fullerton Airport in California. And a friend of mine who was a uh, line boy at the Orange County Airport, John Wayne International, he said, hey, they're hiring guys for uh, a movie. It's supposed to be about Patton, and it's going to take place in Spain. 
and they're hiring a bunch of guys. And I, by this time, I had my multi-engine rating. So I, uh, I went and applied and found out it wasn't going to Spain. It was going to Mexico, flying a B-25. And uh, then uh, I got hired by the uh, by them. I went to uh, went to all match aviation there in Orange County and interviewed for the job. And they hired me and and uh, sent me to one week ground school to be a co pilot on the B twenty five. And uh, on uh, January the first, nineteen sixty nine, we departed Orange County and flew to Wyoming, Mexico, where they were shooting the movie. I guess you'd say it. So what was that first sort of introduction to the B-25 like? Because you've you sort of got, got well, some was, decent hours by now, but when you'd thrown onto that, that must have been a bit exciting. Well, yeah, the biggest multi-engine airplane I'd ever flown was a 160-horsepower Apache, Piper Apache. Then I'm getting into a, a airplane that has two 1,700-horsepower engines. Mainly, I was just the co-pilot. I did did get to fly it, but not until after the captain I was flying with decided it, I was I was safe to solo, as we say in the aviation business. And so I, I did fly the airplane some, but uh, at first I did not. So did they have a like a training camp to get everybody up to speed on the aircraft and what they were? Well, we be had like, like I say we had one week of of ground school in the airplane, and then we fl- went out and flew the airplane. Okay, and I've I've got a couple hours of flying the airplane before we went to Mexico. So, what was that experience like? Flying down to Mexico in a World War II bomber with a whole pile of other World War II bombers to make a movie. Well, it, it, actually, it, we went down there in three different flights. It okay. had a total of sixteen airplanes, but in the uh, in the flight that I was in, we had five. Uh, the first flight left on uh, New Year's Eve. And uh, then uh, we left on the, the January 1st, and I I'm a, I don't remember, but I, I would assume the third flight would have left on January the 2nd. But they were behind me, so I don't remember when they left. Did you get involved in collecting any of the aircraft before you went down, or just the ground school and the training, and off you went? No, they were purchasing those airplanes all over the United States, and uh, people were the, the people that were selling them or the tall man's pilots went out and collected them. So they had all 16 at Orange County Airport. What what sort of and, shape were uh, they in when, when you looked at them as a pilot? Were you sort of happy to jump in them, or do you think this thing looks a bit tired? Uh, I was too inexperienced to know any better. <laughs> I mean, I, the total flight time at the time was probably about, uh, oh, 350 hours, maybe. By the time I got my commercial instrument, multi-engine, and instructor license, I had about maybe 100, 260 hours, and uh, then I got maybe another 100 hours of flight instructing. Did, I don't remember exactly, and I couldn't look it up in my logbook because, unfortunately, I, I lost my logbook, the first oh one. Oh, no. No, I did. I My car broke down on the freeway, and I, had a, I, I didn't get back to it for a couple of days. That comes in later in the story, actually. <laughs> and uh, they towed it, and I know had no idea where they took took it to. Oh, that that sounds terrible. Let, let's let's come back to that one. Were they telling you what you were going to be filming? Had they made much sort of splash about it being Catch Twenty Two? Had you read the book? Did it did it matter to you? I I did read the book. I can't remember if I read it before or after I got hired. Okay, but I did know it was going to be Catch Twenty Two. I, I suppose as you're sitting, Scott and I are sitting here as two big Catch-22 fans, we've got to ask you, what did you think of the book? The book was strange. <laughs> and personally, I thought the movie was terrible. But that's just my <laughs> personal opinion. I, I think the reason I thought it was terrible is because a lot of it didn't follow the book uh, as well as I thought they should. But then, since then, I realized that the movie people aren't as they don't follow books very well. No, no. Yeah. You're you're a man That's after my own hearts, Stunnies. The book's always better. Yeah. Some of the stuff about the uh, oh, you know, the the way they talked, the dialogue in the movie and uh, the whole be- deal with uh Nately's horror and all that just just never went over with me. Yeah. We're we're all nodding heads in yeah. here. So yes, we agree. We with agree you. completely. <laughs> So what, what was it like when you got down to Mexico? What what was the plan when you arrived, or were was it, were they making it up as they went along? 
Well, we were just on call, basically. We They put us all up in a motel just on the edge of, uh, of Wymus. And uh, after we got there, uh, originally we were going to be paid by Tallmance, and then they changed it to Paramount decided they, they were going to pay us. So we were getting uh, dollar dollar amounts into our bank accounts. Somehow, this, uh, they did pay us our per diem in cash every every week. The motel was uh, what you'd consider uh, one star. <laughs> Hot and cold running cockroaches and, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. So it, it, well, it We was... were uh, in their uh, two-door room. And then uh, they would pick us up in a in a like a school bus looking thing, and take us out to the uh, movie set, which was oh a good fifteen twenty minute drive from the motel. And then we'd sit around, and they had a a Quonset hut that was you know, how would you put that um, like our uh, pilot's lounge sort of thing. Yep. And briefing room, and so we'd sit around there, and they'd decide whether they wanted us to do anything, you know, we'd go out and uh, do things to the airplane. Like the these airplanes had old ADF receivers mounted in the above the glare sheet, above the windscreen. And the way we were flying it, we took all that out. So that they had a scrapyard of parts there, which was one of the scenes from the uh, movie that they had all these scrapyard parts there. Uh, you've seen the movie. You, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I know. We 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 play with the airplane, not play with them. We'd uh, go out there, f- keep ourselves familiar with what we're going to do, and then they they also came along and painted all the nose art. The airplanes were already painted before we left Orange County. Uh, the uh, the camo paint, but mm-hmm. then the studio people came and painted all the nose art on, and then threw dirt on the airplanes to make them look w- war weary. So we had to go out and and clean all the all the windows off because nobody's going to go to combat with dirty windows. <laughs> what sort of planning went in, into the flying? Did did they get you guys to practice things before they shot them? Or yeah, you know, we'll, I think we'll we'll come we'll come to the takeoff bit in a minute. But just for the general flying, was there much going into it for what the the director and the rest of the crew were expecting from you? Well, we did do some flying. We had to practice uh, uh, formation flying. Most of the guys that were uh, pilot command were former military, or there was at least one guy that was an uh, active Marine Corps Reserve pilot. I'd say about five or six of the pilots were Boraid bomber pilots, on the, and the, this worked out for them because it was the off-season for Boraid bombing. Mm-hmm. And the, some of the guys that I flew with were uh, either ex-military or or uh, Boraid bombers, or both. We have we even had three pilots there that had all been in the same Corsair squadron in uh, World War II in the Philippines. They are all retired uh, Marine fighter pilots. So that must have sort of meant you had a sort of a good a good crew of guys to to be working with. Trying to think of that of all of the guys that were pilot in command, I can't think of any of them that were bad. You know, of course, I wasn't ever flew with any of the co-pilots, so I have no idea what their uh, <laughs> skill uh, level was. What was it like being on, you know, for, for, for film buffs out there, the 1970s film set is sort of this holy grail of, of time. What was your observations of watching you know, Mike Nichols and everybody do, doing doing their thing? Was it exciting or was it just boring waiting around till you got to do your flying uh i don't know if you ever had any occasion to be uh, on a movie set but uh it's a lot of well let's do this scene and then they do the scene well i didn't quite like that one so let's do that scene again and sometimes they do five six seven repetitions of the same scene the only time it was they didn't do much in the way of repetitions was when we were flying they did, took what we were flying, the film that what they took while we were flying, and uh, bought that. They never, they never had us do a scene again, the same day anyway. Well, let's let's get to that famous opening scene with the with the takeoff because what is in the film looks pretty hairy.
was that like from the from the cockpit? Okay, well, the first time we did that, I happened to be flying a uh, co-pilot for Frank Tallman, and we were number two on takeoff. And that was not bad. I think the first two times we did it, I was number two with Frank Tallman. The uh, third time we did it, I was flying with uh, Stu Kunky, and uh, it, we were number nine. Oh, dear. And uh, <laughs> the turbulence was pretty horrendous. you got to remember that if, if you've seen that scene, I've watched it many times. The briefing was everybody bring the power up to about 30 inches of manifold pressure. And when we yell go on the radio, number one goes, two seconds later, two goes, two seconds later, three goes. There was no spacing between airplanes, basically. If anybody had aborted it, we, you couldn't even turn off the runway because when they dug out the runway on the right-hand side, they're, they're, they left a, a, a berm of about two feet tall. The other side, the left side, was all those tents and stuff that they built up, the hospital building and the headquarters building and all that, were all on the other side of the runway. So we're, they said if you report, take it all the way to the end and stop on the sand on the beach, but you had to go up a, a little hump there at the end to get to the beach. So that would have taken the gear off if, if anybody had done that. Fortunately, nobody ha- ever had an abort on takeoff. The fourth time we did it, I was number 16. And uh, are you familiar with the uh, nose of a V-25? I am, sir, yes. There's an armored piece of glass that's kind of wider at the top and narrows down in the very nose of the airplane. It's probably about two inches thick, or an inch and a half thick something like that. It's a piece of armored glass behind where the bomb site would be. Anyway, a rock got picked up <clears throat> by one of the airplanes further up from us and all the prop wash, because we're all, we hadn't taken off yet. And that rock come bouncing along, bouncing along, and it hit that armored glass on our airplane and cracked it. <laughs> oh and then God. after takeoff, we had a governor failure on the left engine and we had to shut the engine down and come back. Everybody else went off and do whatever they were doing, and we were we had to come back and land. That was the only, I think, the only bad thing that ever happened on the the whole movie. So, well, it, it, like what happened to Frank Tallman on the on the rap scene? But, so tell us about that. What happened to Frank? Well, Frank was you know cutting the dummy in half with a uh, L five Simpson. <laughs> Look. What does he say? He's coming back! And normally that airplane has a uh, wooden prop. What they did, they put a steel, a metal prop on it, and then they uh, strung a piece of cable between the tie-down rings on the uh, landing gear, which are inboard from the tires, so that if the prop didn't hit the dummy, the wire would get it. So they did that scene a couple of times, and then Frank said, they said, well, you're, we're all done, Frank. says, no, no, I want to do it one more time just to make sure. So he did it again, and that time the dummy came apart, and the hand of the dummy got caught between the horizontal stabilizer and the elevator on the airplane. So Frank had to fly the airplane back uh, without any elevator and got brought it back and landed, no problem. That's some bit of flying. Well, you could just pitch the airplane by adding and and decreasing power on the uh, off the propeller. Mm -hmm. You pull the power back. The airplane goes down. You pull the push the power up. The airplane goes up. I understand when you chop the power on a B twenty five, the nose drops quite drastically, doesn't it? Uh, I've never pulled the power that <laughs> back that fast. <laughs> and uh, on landing, you uh, you try to keep it level until you close to the ground. Then you ease the power off and pulling the nose yeah. up. Yeah. So, so the last time we talked, you'd uh, mentioned about sort of the air to air flying and sequencing and filming. You know, can you go over that stuff again? That was really fascinating. We were doing this one scene where a lead airplane, we were stacked up three, uh, one, two, three, then 
four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You know, all airplanes were stacked up, but they're flying in echelon, right echelon. And the camera ship was flying there. Number one of that flight was supposed to come and fly over the top of it. And then after it cleared, then the two, three would break to the left, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, all banking off to the left. And the camera was supposed to see us all kind of diving away. Unfortunately, the uh, the airplane, the pilot, he's dead now, so we, we won't be bad-mouthing him. But anyway, he was trying to hold an exact altitude, and the co-pilot was looking back through the top of the B-25, and he saw that other B-25 getting close. So he's pushing a little bit forward on the on the yoke, and the Frank Pine was the pilot. He He's pulling back to keep it from going down, the co-pilot is pulling back, and then once the airplane went away, the co-pilot took his hand off the yoke, and the airplane pitched up, uh, which put the tail down. The cameraman, he was not strapped in. He would not wear any safety gear, and he was right there at the back of the airplane, and he was floating from the negative bit in the back, and the airplane just, he was floating there, and the airplane just flew off and left him, and he went out through the back of the B-25 and uh, fell 4,000 feet to the water. And he wouldn't like, wear a parachute either. You, you sort of say to yourself, that's terrible. But then if the guy refused to wear any safety gear, you, you do have to yeah, wonder. Well, he he was an Englishman. That would explain, well, explain it. it. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that explains a lot. <laughs> anyway, he, had, he was uh, in a helicopter in a previous movie, with a James Bond movie, where James Bond is escaping in a gyrocopter. Yep. And uh, the gyrocopter, he was hanging out the side of the helicopter with his camera, and the gyrocopter got too close and cut his foot off. And he fell out of the helicopter, fell into a tree, broke his fall, and obviously he lived, because later on he was in Catch-22. You'd think after that you'd never want to do another aerial scene in a movie again. Well, he had uh, giant balls, as they say. (laughs) <laughs> We're going to take a quick break to pop to the Pima Air and Space Museum and find out about one of the aircraft in the incredible Pima collection. Hey, good day. So today uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about one of our very special aircraft in the collection here at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, My name's Scott. I'm the executive director of the museum. And today's subject that we're talking about is our Douglas VC-118A Liftmaster. Uh, This airplane behind us is one of a hundred or so Douglas DC-6 airframe types that the U.S. Air Force owned and operated uh, from the into World War II and well into the 50s. Uh, What distinguishes this airplane from its civilian counterpart was the the installation of a large cargo door on the aft side of the aircraft. Now this airplane itself doesn't have that cargo door anymore because it was converted into a special missions fleet aircraft. So uh, this was part of the basically the executive VIP fleet that has now become known as the the presidential fleet in operation by the U.S. Air Force. This particular airplane uh, is serial number 53 and uh, it came into service with the U.S. Air Force in the in the early 1950s and uh, was part of the VIP fleet. What distinguishes this airplane from many others like it is this was actually a bona fide Air Force One. Um, during the administrations of President Johnson and Kennedy, uh, this airplane was used quite extensively, principally by President Johnson, but occasionally by President Kennedy. Um, Both of the the presidents preferred the larger 707 airframes that we're all familiar with, Um, but at the time, a lot of airfields weren't prepared or able to handle the larger jet aircraft, so this airplane was used for going into smaller, smaller airfields, shorter durations. Um, the, you know, President Kennedy used it to go up to, uh, to the family compound uh, uh, regularly from Washington, D.C. Um, but President Johnson used it quite extensively, so much so that um, uh, being a bit of a control freak and kind of a fusser, uh, he insisted on having a set of basic flight instruments installed in the presidential cabin so he could monitor what the pilot was doing and he would occasionally call up and uh, <laughs> give some advice to the pilot on how he wanted him to trim and fly the airplane and watch the RPM. So. Um, 
So the airplane itself uh, was ultimately replaced by the, the larger jet fleet and retired across the street to uh, Amark in uh, 1975. And in 1978, it came over here as, as part of the permanent collection of the P. Marin Space Museum. Um, it is one of the, I think, only one of the only actual presidential Air Force Ones that's outside of Dayton or the Presidential Library Network. So we're, we're very fortunate to, to have that here in our collection, along with several other VIP fleet airframes. To find out what's going on at the Pima Air and Space Museum and to see the incredible collection that they have, please visit www.pimaair.org for more information and be sure to give them a follow via all the links in the description to this episode. And now back to the show. What was life on set like for the pilots? Because I, I guess you guys would spend a lot of time together. What What do you sort of remember from the the hanging around and and shooting the breeze? Uh, well, typical pilots. There, we were telling war stories. They had a, a volleyball court set up next to the Quonset hut, and a few poker games going on. And at lunchtime, of course, we they fed us lunch at. Uh, they had a mess hall for everybody, so we'd go over there and have lunch and shoot the breeze with some of the movie stars. I had Did lunch a few have... times with uh, Bob Newhart and uh, uh, Martin Balsam and uh forget the, guys, the other guy's name. And so, you know, I mean, you got to remember, this is 54 years ago. God. Oh, sure. No worries, yeah. Yep. Yep. What, what, what was Bob Newhart like? Because, yeah. He was Bob, always Bob's on. He was a legend. He was always telling jokes, telling stories, very entertaining. So did any of the uh the cast do any actual flying with the uh, with with you guys in the B so in the B25s? I don't think so. Uh the only time you ever saw them in the airplane was when they're like the start of the movie. Those the uh the guys in the co-pilot seat, the airplanes were just sitting there and they just you know just came by with a pickup truck with a camera on it to make it look like they were going the other direction. And then Alan Arkin, he only got in the airplane when he absolutely had to for the, he didn't like airplanes, I guess. <laughs> so that, that first shot of him kind of sum, sums up his feelings about it. Yeah, I think about airplanes anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think any of them really uh, asked to go. I don't remember any of them flying. Hmm, interesting. Uh, Dick Benjamin might have, He, I think he wanted to go, but they. I don't think they'd let him. <laughs> yeah. So how long were you on station for, for the flying? How many weeks did it take to get all the, the shots that they made? I was there about oh three months, and then they decided that they didn't need all of us, so they let let a bunch of us go. Sent a, they brought a DC-3 down from the States and picked us up and took us back to Orange County. And then uh, three weeks later, they wanted us, some of us back, so I went back down finished up the, the the filming there we did, i didn't get back home till june first part of june i guess it was so uh, they didn't have as many crews as they did originally so when it time to go home i took a b25 back to orange county went back to wymus picked up another b25 went back to orange county went back and got a third one and brought it back and then I was, I stayed on working for uh, Tall Mance for about a month or six weeks on payroll, but not doing anything. They were supposed to get a contract, another contract, and uh, that fell through. So then I, they let me go. How did the aircraft behave with all that flying? Well, the airplanes were, you know, the airplanes were fine. Uh, they're just a big, heavy airplane. On the flight back from uh, Wymus to uh, Orange County in the DC-3, I went up and asked if I could fly the the uh, DC three, and I you know I sat in the seat for twenty minutes, thirty minutes, whatever it was, and it, it was so much lighter on the controls than a than a B twenty five. Really, wow! So I guess looking back, what's your standout memory of that time down in the Mexican desert with with a whole pile of B twenty fives and movie stars that didn't want to go anywhere near you? Uh, well, they wouldn't. It wasn't that they wouldn't go near us. It just uh, we didn't live in the same. Uh, they lived in a hotel. We lived in a motel. We just didn't <laughs> see them except on on the shooting site, and uh, had no real real reason to interact. 
what did you do next? Because Scott's told me about your involvement with the T6 as well, and that that sounds fascinating. Well, I've done a lot of things since then, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I uh, uh, after the movie was over, I used some time off to go and get a uh, airline transport pilot's license, and then I got hired by PSA Airline Training School in San Diego, and I taught Japanese student pilots for about a year. And then I went to the Marshall Islands and flew for the U.S. Army as a civilian at the Pacific Missile Range, flying caribous and C-54s inner island, taking people to work. From there, I went to uh, work for World Airways as a flight engineer, second officer on a 707. And that was in 73 when the big fuel crunch hit. So I was out of work, and I got a short contract with Egypt Air. That didn't work out, and uh, I wound up going to Saudi Arabia for three years. Started out as a light twin captain, and after about a year and a half of that, upgraded to captain on a 737. Then I came back to the the States and went back to work for World Airways after being furloughed for four years. And I flew for them until I was 50 years old. When I, when I came back from Saudi Arabia and was working for World, I met my present wife, and we got married in 1980. Two weeks later, we bought a T6. Does, so does your, is your wife a pilot as well? No, she <laughs> she was a crew scheduler for United Airlines. Oh, right. <laughs> but anyway, we uh, bought the airplane and had fun restoring it because and repainting it because it, it had a civilian paint job on it, and I repainted it as a SBD uh, Marine Corps markings mm-hmm. from World War II. Actually, started the war because the star I put on it had that the meatball in the middle of the star. Yeah, so I, uh, we were at the Reno Air Races in uh, 1985, and I was talking to this. We we had already been members of this group called the. T6 Owners Association, and the fellow who ran it had gotten divorced and hadn't done anything with it for over a year. So we were talking to him at the Reno Air Races, and he says, you know, we'd like to get your membership list and because we want to invite them to come to a T6 fly-in in October. And he says, oh, you want it? You got it. And he says, so at that time, I had a Chevy van, and I went over to his hangar, and he had like four or five cardboard boxes full of all kinds of stuff. And he, we just loaded them in my car and went home and started going through it and writing you know, letters to all these people to see if they wanted to do this get-together. Some of them were in other parts of the country. And we decided we'd start the, well, what evolved into being the North American Trainer Association. But we started publishing a, a, a newsletter for it and then, that involved into a magazine, and we did that for 31 years. And uh, then in 1987, we went to the Warbird Operators Conference in uh, Dallas-Fort Worth and got together with the CAF and the T-34 Association. What we wanted to do was standardize formation flying in air shows. So we all got together and we told uh, talked to the FAA about it, and they said, yeah, well... We were going to change the FARs about formation flying, and we said, hey, if you'll let us just run a standardization program of, among warbirds, then you won't have to mess with it. That's how, how the uh, formation flying bit at air shows got so standardized, and, and we, we had a good time doing it. 1988 was the uh, 50th anniversary of the first flight of the T-6, and we had a get-together in Kenosha, Wisconsin. We wound up with 106 T6s. Wow. That must have been And then every sight. five years after that, we'd pick a place and we'd get together. And almost always, it was somewhere in the Midwest where you could uh, fly. The ones that wanted to do it would fly into Oshkosh and, and be on the flight line there. Mm-hmm. So what about you now? Do you still fly or are those days behind? No, I, after I sold the airplane and uh, I continued... Uh, for uh, another year or so, when I was 50, I quit World Airways and went uh, went corporate flying, okay. flying King Airs. And uh, I did that till I was 64. And I got, uh, I sold the airplane and then retired from uh, 
corporate flying, so I didn't have any extra money to keep the airplane. So I got, I guess you, the other way around, I corporate flying and then didn't have the extra money for the T6, so I sold it. Do, but I had it still for keep, 24 years, enjoyed it. Do you still keep tabs on it to make sure it's okay? Uh, it's in Illinois someplace. Okay. <laughs> it belongs to a lawyer. I don't, I don't talk to lawyers much. <laughs> no i don't uh, i don't fly anymore of, of hell i'm 85 years old nobody trusts me on an airplane you, you sound still sprightly sir so i wasn't going to presume uh well i'm still keeping going uh i'm vertical every morning <laughs> so looking back at all your years of flying you know is is there a highlight for you was was it the film or is there something that just stands out in your in your career as a pilot well, it, yeah th- th- that uh, well, I wound up flying uh, more than a T6 and a B25. I got to fly the uh, PT PV2 Neptune and mm-hmm. the A26 Invader. Uh, yep. I did get to fly some a couple hours in a Huey helicopter. But of my three airplanes to own or fly, I should say, the T6, the King Air 200, and the 747. <laughs> well, well, Scott's got a couple of those out here, so. Yeah, well, I I wound up you know, with World uh, before I quit. I've, I like I say, I was with the seven thirty seven with Saudia, the seven oh seven, the uh, seven twenty seven, the DC eight, DC ten, and seven four seven with World. Being a non skid pilot, we just went all over the world. Had strange things happen to us, or funny things happen to us. So with that list of aircraft, you've sort of got the full deck of that sort of great sixties and seventies. U.S. civil aviation tradition on 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 your card, haven't you? Yeah, I wound up with uh, I've flown fifty nine different airplanes. The time I have the most most time of all my flying is, is in the King Air because I I did fly those in Saudi Arabia before I got on the seven thirty seven, and after I quit World Airways at age fifty, I flew another fourteen years in King Airs. Mm-hmm. This has been absolutely fascinating, Stoney. Thank you so much for for joining us and, and sharing some of your stories. No problem. I still keep in contact with three of the other co-pilots. I don't keep track of any of the captains because most of them, unfortunately, are dead. How often do you talk, get on a call and have a beer and reminisce? Oh, uh, well, one lives in Wisconsin. Another one lives in the Dallas area. The other one lives in Orange County. So I don't see them much, but... We keep in contact with uh, with emails mostly. Mm-hmm. You didn't happen to see the the little bit of flying of the two B twenty fives in the new TV series version that George Clooney did, did you? Uh, I that was on one of those Netflix or something. Uh, yeah, I don't yeah, subscribe to that stuff, so I no, oh, I have not. I'd like to see it, but uh, I don't know how I could do it uh, without getting it into Netflix or whatever. <laughs> yeah. I'd be more than happy to watch it. I think it works better closer to the book but the flying's not nearly as good well they only had two airplanes yeah you can't do a 16 had, ship uh, take off with two planes yeah we had uh we had 17 airplanes of which one they destroyed as you you know you see the one burning up in the in the movie yeah that one was uh bought in uh over in baja someplace buried over to wymus uh gear down and then they burned it up for the scene in the movie and then after the movie was over, that I was told that Paramount had to go in and take everything that they brought in there, all the spare parts and everything. They had to ship all that stuff out of there. Either that or figure out a way to give it to to the local Mexican. How how do you feel about knowing that those aircraft that flew on that movie are the reason we still have B twenty fives flying around today? That that's quite a legacy, really. Oh, I would uh, wouldn't doubt it. I mean, there were. A couple of them uh, uh, I know were lost. One of the Tallman ones were destroyed doing a drug run down in South America someplace. Okay. A lot of them are in museums. The one I flew mostly, well, the first half of the movie, I should say, is in uh, Grissom Air Force Base. There are others that are uh, scattered around museums and, and uh, flying. The one that was abominable, abom, abominable snowman ended up at the RAF museum and is now at East Links Museum up in up in England, and they're trying to get her ground running again. It's only a hundred gallons an hour. What the hell, per engine? <laughs> <laughs>
They're, well, they're, they're also trying to get a Lancaster flying as well, so you can see the type of people they are. I, I look at a lot of different uh, aviation websites, and the Lancaster, to me, looks so antiquated, even compared to the DC-3. I, just, I don't know why. It's just a, a, a flat compass on the instead of one up, up on the uh, instrument panel. The, never could figure that one out. But the, when I moved my airplane up here to Washington from California, I hangered with a Hawker Hurricane. Now, now you're speaking my language, sir. I love that aircraft. Well, it's out in in Virginia with uh, that uh, Warbird Museum there mm-hmm. in Virginia. But uh, yeah, I hangered with that Hurricane for uh, probably seven or eight years. I helped the owner restore it because it wasn't flying when I got here. Right. Okay. That was another thing I thought was kind of strange. I mean, the gear handle and the flap handle are the same handle. Yeah. It's that big H box down on the right hand side, isn't it? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Looks like the gear shift out of a, a sports car. It shocked me the first time I saw it. It was like four on the floor, but it doesn't quite do the same thing. No, when I when I hangered with them when I first started, the wings weren't on yet and it was all in silver. And then they had a hell of a time getting the, the proper bladders for the air brakes. The friend of mine that owned it, he's He's passed away now, but uh, he bought that thing up in Canada. You know who Harry Wyatt is? I've heard the name, yeah. Yes, I visited his hey, farm when I was a kid. Yeah, he's got, uh, well, he. I think he's passed away too, but he had, and uh, Neil had, uh, they have got together and they bought a couple of hurricanes. And Neil bought the fuselage and two wings and got everything down here to, to Vancouver and found out he... I can't remember if he had two right wings or two left wings, so he had to do some horse trading to get the other side done. And then, of course, he had to do a, redo all the woodwork on the fuselage. We've taken a good chunk of your time, Stoney. I just want to thank you so much. This has been so much fun chatting with you. Thank you for, for joining us. Well, no problem. I, as, I told, as I said before, I'm retired. I'm usually here if you have any more questions. <laughs> Oh, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to think of things as soon as we stop chatting. Okay. So, so I'll be in touch. But thank you so much. Okay. What the hell are we doing? Yo, Saturday, it's not our business to ask. Whose business is it? Four minutes to target. You're ready to take us in, Yo, Saturday. Get ready to dump. What are you doing? We're not there yet. Get away from there, on Come on, Yo, Saturday, you're going to screw up the whole mission. What's going on, Yo, Saturday? Get ready to turn. Yo, Saturday, what are you doing? What? I don't know. Just hit on the ocean? Yes, sir. A marvelous bomb pattern. We have aerial photographs if you'd like to see them. Are you telling me we're going to decorate a bunch of men who dropped 20 tons of very expensive bombs on the Mediterranean? Well, sir, if you consider the alternative... The alternative is that we take the whole crew of numbskulls out and shoot them. Might be a problem there, sir. All right. I know. We can't shoot the sons of bitches. We can court-martial them, see that they rot in some stockade. Well, sir, we felt that a court-martial might get unavoidable publicity. And if we got around it, we use one of our missions to bomb the ocean. You don't have to say anything more, Colonel. I cannot thank Stoney Sonich enough for joining us here on the Damcasters, and as always, to Scott Marchand for helping to make this one happen. This was one of those conversations I was really excited that we were able to do, and it went interesting places. Stoney has flown just about everything. So to be able to chat to someone like him was a real privilege. So thank you so much, Stoney, for your time. Got to do it again if you're around, if you're listening to this. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who's been supporting the pod through listening, watching, and doing all the like, subscribe, putting stars into your podcast app of choice. 
it all helps. Our AI overlords keep an eye on all these things. And I really, really do appreciate it. If you want to support the pod more directly, we have our Damn Kisteers program over on Patreon, which from just three pounds a month, plus a bit of that, you get these episodes ad free with a little different intro at the beginning for them. We've got our Zoom social, which should have been while I was ill. So we're going to have it in September. Everyone who is a paid up member of that can join as well. We're putting some more articles and bits and pieces up there as we go along, as I get the time and join us. It's fun. Three pounds a month at the bottom tier, plus the VAT. Good community of people on there, including a few people that have shown up on the pod as well. But if you can't do that, like and subscribe. Stars in your podcast app of choice with a little review. Comments are great. And follow us on the socials. All the links are in the description below. And check out Pima. Pima are great. Head out to Tucson. Like I said, it's been raining. How weird is that? It's the desert. Times are changing, people. Next time, we will have another episode, which I'm still working on. We've got one or two things on the bubble. And one that's likely to be coming up reasonably soon will be about the sinking of HMS Bismarck and Hassar, which was done by typhoons. So thank you always for your support. Until next time, please do take care of yourselves. Also check in with your friends. It's the time of year when everybody thinks everything's going okay. Because as you can see, it is sunny here in Sussex. It's quite warm, hence the bright red face. Apologize for that. But check in with your friends. It's always on the sunniest days that some people can be in the darkest of places. So always check in. And also on the flip side, always ask for help. There's always someone out there. So thank you for your support. Thanks for watching. And until next time, bye-bye. I just want to say many thanks to our fabulous Damn Castiers on Patreon. If you head over to our Patreon page, you can join the crew and get your name in the credits from just £3 a month plus a bit of that. The Damn Casters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and is a Boney Abroad podcast production.